Good morning and welcome to St. George's online service for this first Sunday after the Epiphany. I have to say it's good to be doing this back in the church. But for those of you at home, I hope that you'll enjoy the service, that you'll join in the songs and the prayers, and with that I'll get started. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Together we pray the Collect for Purity. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray together the Collect for the first Sunday after Epiphany. Steadfast God, you have enriched and enlightened us by the revelation of your eternal Christ. Strengthen us to walk the path of his teaching, so that by word and deed and in the power of the Spirit, we may manifest the gracious news of your faithfulness and love. Amen. reading from the Gospel of John. This is the testimony given by John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny it, but confessed, I am not the Messiah. And they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, No. Then they said to him, Who are you? Let us have an answer for those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, Why then are you baptizing if you are neither the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, I baptize with water. Among you stands one whom you do not know, the one who is coming after me. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandal. This took place in Bethany, across the Jordan, where John was baptizing. The next day, he saw Jesus coming towards him and declared, Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks ahead of me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but I came baptizing with water for this reason, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John testified, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and John 
and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I myself have seen and have testified, this is the Son of God, the Gospel of Christ. Last week we celebrated the Epiphany, that's when the Magi travelled to Bethlehem to present gifts to the infant Jesus. The word Epiphany means manifestation or making known of a divine figure. The Magi recognised Jesus' special holiness by bringing him those strange gifts that Jan spoke about last week. Gold for royalty, incense for divinity and myrrh to foretell Jesus' earthly fate. In ordinary language, epiphany has come to mean just another kind of aha moment. You might, or might not, recall an epiphany when you finally understood a difficult math concept like calculus. For me, getting my first chemistry textbook was a moment of epiphany in my own life. But today is the first Sunday after the epiphany. We don't have a whole season of epiphany just to help us count Sundays, of course. The gospel readings for the Epiphany season are all about different people coming to recognise who Jesus was. And today we heard John's version of a story that's much more familiar in Matthew's Gospel and Mark and Luke. And I'll use Mark for comparison. We have to be careful as we read today's Gospel because it's easy to confuse the two Johns as John the Baptist and John the Gospel writer. Now at the beginning of today's passage, some temple leaders came and confronted John the Baptist. They asked him if he was the Messiah, and he told them he wasn't. He also told them he wasn't Elijah, come back to earth, and he wasn't a prophet. He was just one who was crying in the wilderness. In other words, John the Gospel writer put those words into John's mouth. But of course, in the other Gospels, they're merely reported. That conversation, we're told, took place in Bethany, which was, as it says, across the Jordan from where John was baptizing. Now, Bethany was just east of uh, Jerusalem. It might all be called, thought of being called a suburb of Jerusalem, but it was about 20 miles from the Jordan River. We're then told that the Baptist saw Jesus the next day, but we don't know where that happened. Did they actually meet? Did John leg it over from, Je from Bethany to the Jordan River? If so, was he baptizing people on that day? Because unlike Mark, John's Gospel doesn't say that John the Baptist actually baptized Jesus. But the Gospel writers do all agree that the Messiah would baptize with the Holy Spirit, unlike John, who baptized with water. They also record the presence of the dove, which symbolized Jesus' holiness. In Mark, the dove appeared when the, baptism, when the Baptist actually did the baptism of Jesus. But John's Gospel doesn't record Jesus' baptism at all. Instead, the Baptist asserted that he already expected that the dove would be the sign of the Holy Spirit. He recognized who Jesus was when he saw the dove rest upon him, and that's why he was able to testify that Jesus was the Son of God. 
And that made me ask myself, well, how do we identify people? At a very trivial level, we identify them by what they look like, their face, their hair, their general appearance. But at a deeper level, we identify people by their character. And I think that that's what John the Baptist was doing when he recognized Jesus as the Son of God. He recognized his special holiness. It's like how Jesus said elsewhere in the Gospels that we recognize a person by their fruit. And he was making here a parallel with a, with a fruit tree, that we recognize a good fruit tree when it has good fruits and a poor fruit tree when it doesn't. But John's Gospel has an important difference from Mark and Matthew and Luke, when the Baptist met Jesus. He said, here is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. What an extraordinary thing to say to someone that you're meeting for the first time. But the expression, the Lamb of God, reminds us that Jesus will become a sacrifice, like the lambs at Passover. It's like the symbol of myrrh in the Epiphany story we had last week. In other words, both Gospel writers, Matthew and John, are right, reading back what they already know, that Jesus' death will not come as a surprise. The Baptist didn't just call Jesus the Lamb of God. He said the Lamb of God will take away the sin of the world. That means that this Gospel writer must have known about St Paul's letter to the Romans and subscribed to Paul's ideas that we've heard before about why Jesus had to die. This past week, I was not only preparing this homily, but I was also drafting my vestry report for our annual vestry meeting. Vestry reports look backwards on the past year. In the Epiphany season, we look back to Christmas when more and more people recognized who Jesus was. Shepherds and Magi came to Bethlehem. Simeon and Anna felt the divine presence when Jesus' parents took them to the temple. And now today, the Baptist sees, sees Jesus' holiness as if a dove had settled on his shoulder. But the Epiphany season also calls us to look to the future. Otherwise, we could just say, well, Jesus is divine, so what? But the so what is that Scripture now calls us to begin to follow Jesus in his public ministry, what he said and did, so that we can become disciples. And just as the gospel writers continued forward from recognizing to Jesus' ministry, so also to us. Now's the right time to start looking forward to the next chapter of St. George's. The pandemic will end one day. We will return to in-person worship. So how will our parish respond? I'm sure there will be a temptation to put back everything and recreate it exactly the way that it was before. Before we do that, I ask you to remember these words of St. Paul. In Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. And I believe that we have to ask ourselves what it is that we must recreate and what we must change. This must be our epiphany, our aha moment. Where is God calling us to something new? How will, we can, how will we continue to reach out to the people who joined us remotely during the pandemic? Surely we don't want to just leave them in the lurch and dump them. And that means we have to continue online ministry in some form, even when we start to gather again in person. In reality, the pandemic has merely accelerated a move towards electronic worship that was happening anyway, and we faced it anyway. But how should we go about doing this? It would be a huge mistake for us to just arrive back in church in one Sunday and then say, well, what are we going to do? So I ask you to please think about this. I think it's very important for the future of the parish so that we can discuss it at our vestry meeting in a month's time. So I ask you please to think about this and come with your thoughts. Amen.
the response to our petitions today goes like this. You'll hear me say, there's a voice in the wilderness crying, and then you are invited to respond with, make straight the way of the Lord. Let us pray. God, we are grateful to be able to worship you today. We thank you for the community of St. George's and for each person here and the families that each one of us represents. We ask for your support as we live lives filled with work and responsibilities in the continued uncertainty brought about by COVID. Inspire us as you inspire John the Baptist to join in your transforming work. There's a voice in the wilderness crying, make straight the way of the Lord. Bring awareness to this community of faithful followers, the personal sorrow, loneliness, and fear experienced by those here in our midst. Move in our hearts in such a way that we can share each other's burdens. There's a voice in the wilderness crying, make straight the way of the Lord. We thank you that we have the pleasure of seeing your hand at work in the seasons, notwithstanding this season of winter. We are grateful for the muffled quiet brought on by a snowfall, for the fun of winter recreation, for the sound of crunching snow underfoot on a crisp winter walk, and the pleasure that a bright colored bird at a bird feeder brings on a gray wintry day. There's a voice in the wilderness crying, make straight the way of the Lord. We ask for your protection on those who are without heat or homes at this time of year in cold and wind and snow. We are grateful for your servants who work directly with the poor and we ask you to encourage them in their work and encourage us to be generous with our resources. There's a voice in the wilderness crying, make straight the way of the Lord. With the promise of a new year still fresh in our minds and resolutions to reset priorities and embrace transformation still fresh in our hearts, we pray for clarity and the courage to do as Isaiah and John the Baptist direct, prepare in the desert a highway for our God. There's a voice in the wilderness crying, make straight the way of the Lord. You have enriched and enlightened us by the incarnation and revelation of Christ. Strengthen us to walk the path of his teaching so that our words and actions may be a witness of your faithfulness and love. There's a voice in the wilderness crying, make straight the way of the Lord. At this time, all present here are invited to offer out loud or silently any prayers of petition or thanksgiving, or maybe the name of someone on your heart. For these things spoken and unspoken, there's a voice in the wilderness crying, make straight the way of the Lord. You've heard the prayers of your faithful people, God. You know our needs before we ask. Grant our requests as may be best for us. This we ask in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. And now let us pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. I heard the voice of Jesus say, Behold, I freely give the living water. Thirsty one, stoop down and drink and live. I came to Jesus and I drank of the life-giving stream. My thirst was quenched, my soul revived, and now I live.
Now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, our creating Father and Mother, Jesus our brother and guide, and the animating and inspiring Holy Spirit be with you all this day and always. Amen.